We all encounter a large number of different kinds of organisms every day, and we have different categories and names that we apply to them to refer to the different organisms that we see. The purpose of this web lecture is to introduce you to the different ways we have of classifying organisms and why it matters what kind of system we use to name and classify organisms in the world. From the earliest days of language, we've needed mechanisms to communicate to one another about the properties of the different organisms in our environment. So if you imagine, uh, I'm hungry, do I want to eat the really pretty mushrooms that look like they're made of candy, or do I want to eat the ugly brown mushrooms that look like they're made of mud? And maybe your friend can tell you, well, you know, my cousin tried the candy mushrooms the other week and, and he died. So I would go for the mud mushrooms if I were you. So knowing that you can have this common vocabulary so that you can understand the properties, what's good to eat, what's not good to eat, what's poisonous, what is going to hunt you down and kill you. You need to be able to know what things in your environment are useful and which ones are dangerous. So we've always had names for organisms. But as people started moving around from region to region, what they found is that often in different places they would have different names for basically the same animal or plant or any kind of organism. And that's really not very helpful because you don't really know whether you're talking about the same thing or something different. If I talk to you about a puma and uh, my friend over in California calls it a cougar and then Elsewhere in the United States, they call it a mountain lion or a cantamount, a Florida panther down here in our neck of the woods, or south of the border, is it a leon colorado, gato monte? How do we know whether we're talking about the same kind of animal or a different kind of animal? As it turns out, this problem was largely solved, at least for scientists, way back in the 18th century by Carlos Linnaeus, who came up with the very familiar system of taxonomy that we use still to this day. Uh, the kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species system that we use to describe and categorize different organisms. So basically individuals that are very similar to each other are grouped together in the same species, which may have subspecies of groups that are somewhat differentiated but still are an interbreeding group of organisms. Species that are very similar to each other get grouped together in the same genus genera that are very similar to each other get grouped together in the same family and so on up the ladder until we can classify basically all of the organisms in the world in this way. And Linnaeus also introduced binomial nomenclature so that we refer to a particular species by its genus and species name. So now when we come across this animal, I'm from California originally, I still like to call it a cougar even though I'm down here in Florida where, where we call it a panther. When I'm talking to other scientists, I can refer to puma concolor. We can all agree on what animal that is and, um, and discuss it scientifically. So this is very useful that we all now have this common naming system, this common classification system to use so that we can all communicate as scientists. But now, in the age of evolutionary thinking, the system of classification still leaves a number of questions unanswered. So what we end up doing is we put a whole bunch of groups in a bin like this, see the little boxes in the bigger box. But now we have evolutionary questions about how these boxes within the boxes might be related to each other. And so now, in the age of evolutionary or phylogenetic or cladistic thinking, we want to categorize these things in a different way so that we can actually see the evolutionary relationships within these groups. This gives us a more accurate representation of the evolutionary history of these groups and how they're actually related to each other. So we call this a cladogram or a phylogenetic tree. These groupings are known as clades. So any of these groups that come from a single node is called a clade, and these clades represent evolutionary relationships. So to contrast that with the kinds of groupings that we got with Linnaean taxonomy, Linnaean taxonomy was based on what we call grade. So a grade is a group that shares many features in common, such as fish, they all kind of look fishy, they have scales and fins and tails with fins, they have a lot in common. Reptiles, again, they're 
egg laying, heterotherms, they all have a lot in common. Uh, homeotherms, birds and mammals having a high metabolic rate, maintaining their body temperature independent of the external temperature gives them a lot in common. We might be tempted to group them together in a taxonomic group based on their grade. A clade has a very specific evolutionary definition. It's a group that includes a single common ancestor and all of its descendants, all of its descendants. So each splitting point or node on the phylogenetic tree defines a clade or a monophyletic group. So each of these circled groups are clades. You see it includes a common ancestor represented here and all of its descendants coming from both of the branches. This node defines this circled clade here this node finds this circled clade, and we've got one that isn't circled, defined by this node that includes groups 1, 2, and 3. So these are monophyletic groups, also known as clades. So now I'd like to go over some of the terminology that's used in reading and interpreting these phylogenetic trees. So the very, very base of the tree is called the root. Each of these branching points, as I have mentioned before, is called a node and then the two lines that come off of the node are referred to as branches. So all of this is a single branch until you come to another node where it splits again into two branches. And these at the end are called tips or terminal nodes. And evolutionary transitions, so evolutionary changes that occur in a lineage are marked by little lines crossing the branches. With respect to time, the root is always the most ancient, and we get more recent in time as we go out toward the tips. So these phylogenetic trees are always read in the time scale from the root out toward the tips. This split happened longer ago than this split. This split happened longer ago than this split. So there's a time scale encoded in these phylogenetic trees. These clades are formed based on shared derived characters, evolutionary changes that happened in those lineages. We call these synapomorphies, synapomorphies. So for example, this ancestral cat had a long tail, and then the individuals who were evolving along this line had an evolutionary innovation that went from long-tailed to bobbed tail. These two living groups at the tips both have shared that derived character of having a bobbed tail, so we group them together based on that shared derived character. Similarly, the ancestral state is to have a flecked coat. Moving from flex to rosettes unites all of these groups here. But we group these clades together solely based on shared derived characters, evolutionary novelties, evolutionary innovations, not overall similarity. In contrast, the Linnaean classification system tends to result in non-monophyletic or unnatural groupings, groupings that don't really reflect the evolutionary history of the groups. So one of these kinds of non-monophyletic groups is called a paraphyletic group. So these are generally joined together by symplesiomorphies or shared ancestral characters, things that were present ancestrally that are not evolutionary novelties within that group. So an example is invertebrates. Invertebrates are characterized by not having a vertebral column, and so it includes basically all of the groups except vertebrates. That character that joins them, that feature of not having a vertebral column, is not an evolutionary innovation, right? That's, that's the default. That's what all the organisms kind of came into being with. The vertebral column was what was the evolutionary novelty, and that joins together all of the vertebrates. In vertebrates, uh, if you were to try to make that into a monophyletic group, so here's the common ancestor, um, and then all of these descendants are missing from that group. So one way you can think about this for paraphyletic groups, if you're trying to get your whole family in the car to go on a trip, you want to make sure that all of your kids are in the car. If some of your kids are missing, not in the car, you've got a paraphyletic group. So 
This is leaving out all of these other groups that are evolutionarily related, descended from the same common ancestor. Another example is fish. So here's the common ancestor of all of the things that we would consider fish, and all of the tetrapods, all of the terrestrial vertebrates are left out of that group, even though they share this evolutionary relationship. Reptiles. Okay, there's a common ancestor here of everything that we would call reptiles, and oops, birds are left out. So these are paraphyletic groups. Not all the kids are in the car. And again, generally joined together by shared ancestral characters rather than evolutionary novelties or new characters. The other kind of non-monophyletic group that we find are polyphyletic groupings. So if in a paraphyletic group we're saying that you're trying to get all the kids in the car to, to go somewhere and you're missing some kids, the polyphyletic group would be kind of the opposite of that. You've got all your kids in your car plus some of the neighbor's kids. Um, are all the kids in the car yours? If you've got some extras that don't really belong there, you've got a polyphyletic group. So an example of this is if you wanted to create a taxonomic group that includes mammals and birds because of all the things that they share in common, um, having a four-chamber heart, having a high metabolic rate, maintaining their body temperature, you would have basically a polyphyletic group. So these groups are generally joined together by convergent evolution, so the independent evolution of derived characters. So mammals and birds both have a four-chambered heart, but they both evolved that four-chamber heart separately. They didn't both inherit it from the same common ancestor. Same thing with all of the things that birds and mammals share in common that aren't also shared by the rest of the reptiles. And so mammals, if you include birds in the same group, birds don't belong there. You've got an extra kid in the car. To have a monophyletic group, you need to get rid of the extra kid. So let's just review some of the terminology we've been using here to describe these phylogenetic trees. So the approach that we're taking is cladistics. And in the cladistics approach, groups of organisms are joined together in clades based only on shared derived characters, new evolutionary things that have happened. As a result, this diagram reflects our best hypothesis currently about how these groups evolved and what the relationships are between them. So again, these shared derived characters are called synapomorphies. Shared derived characters are called synapomorphies. Shared ancestral characters are known as symplesiomorphies. So these, this is the original character state that was present in the common ancestor of the group shared by more than one member. So for example, the long tail on all of these groups is a symplesiomorphy. It's identical to the ancestral state. If we are going to describe the character states themselves, they can be derived or apomorphic. So with respect to this clade that we're looking at here, bobbed tail is an apomorphic or derived state, as opposed to the ancestral or plesiomorphic character state, which is the same as that of the most recent common ancestor. So long tail would be the plesiomorphic character state with respect to this clade. These are defined only with respect to a particular clade. So if we're looking at this entire clade, beginning with node 1, the flecked coat is the plesiomorphic state, the ancestral state, whereas rosettes are the apomorphic or derived state. But if you're just looking at this clade that is defined by node 3, rosettes are the ancestral or plesiomorphic state because that was the state of the common ancestor of this entire clade. And then things like stripes would be apomorphic traits with respect to that clade. So monophyletic or non-monophyletic groups that accurately portraying evolutionary history, why should I care about this? Well, there are several reasons. So first of all, just in the, uh, in the study of organismal diversity, we know that closely related species or clades are more likely to share traits with one another. So if you want to study, for example, extinct species such as dinosaurs, you can use these kinds of approaches to look at the characteristics of their closest relatives to infer 
some of the character states that might have also been present in the extinct species. Also, accurate phylogenies help to track the sources and vectors of human diseases like SARS or AIDS or Ebola or Zika virus. So it has very important human health applications. Also, uh, in the world of conservation biology, how do you know what unit you need to protect to be able to maintain diversity? You need to know which are the monophyletic groups and how you can best uh, preserve ecologically significant taxonomic units. So not just the number of species, but really maintaining evolutionary diversity. We need to have these visual representation, these phylogenetic trees, with accurate portrayals of evolutionary history to be able to make those kinds of judgments. So let's just finish up by summarizing the overall differences between the Linnaean and the cladistic classification systems. So looking at the older Linnaean system, we saw that groupings are based on overall similarity, so how much groups of organisms resemble each other. And this can result in the formation of unnatural groups that don't reflect evolutionary relationships. So we end up getting polyphyletic and paraphyletic groups. Um, the upside of this classification system is that it gives us a familiar and manageable number of group names that we can use when we're conversing with one another. It's very convenient to be able to say reptiles or fish and have everybody understand what we mean by that. On the cladistic side of this, we know that the groupings are based solely on synapomorphies, shared derived characters. And because of this, because everything is based on new evolutionary events that happened in lineages, these groups reflect our best understanding of evolutionary relationships and the evolutionary history of these lineages. So only monophyletic groups are recognized in a cladistic taxonomic system. But the downside of that is that all monophyletic groups are recognized within the cladistic taxonomic system. So this becomes a hugely unmanageable number of named groups, often with names that are not familiar to most people. So what we end up with is if we are talking about evolutionary relationships, we tend to use cladistic nomenclature and only recognize monophyletic groups. In more casual conversations about organisms, it's fine to go back to names of polyphyletic or paraphyletic groups that everybody will recognize and agree on, but we need to understand that those are not natural groupings, those are not evolutionarily significant groupings uh, when we use that terminology.